All right, here we go. Invertebrates, as opposed to vertebrates, which we'll discuss probably in two or three lessons away. This group of creatures makes up the greatest amount of diversity. They have the oldest history on the planet. They have the largest amount of biomass on the planet. And uh, they have accomplished a number of things and will take us across a number of different thresholds. So when we talk about invertebrates, some of them are very familiar to you, like you can see on that little cartoon graphic there, bugs, you know, insects, arthropods, but it actually is a much larger group. And uh, we are gonna take the time, probably about two or three lessons, to talk about their diversity, their arrangement, and their organization. <clears throat> so it is sometimes hard to keep invertebrates separate. Uh, they look like each other, they have strange symmetry, um, they share old family recipes. In other words, they build off of each other's structures and I have arranged them not only in their history of life on this planet, but also going from one step to another and trying to understand their relationship to each other. So invertebrates have a number of ways that you can kind of situate them to each other. We will start off with the simplest multicellular creatures, periphera, like pores, it means it flows through, and sponges is what I'm talking about. And they are they make the transition from colonial to multicellular, but no true tissues. Whereas when we get into cnidarians, they'll have a neural net, but lack a mesoderm. And so on and on we'll go, and increasing the complexity with each move. And so uh, made more complicated, we'll try and define each one of these groups. I'll probably make a pod where I ask you, what is a sponge? What is an idarian or a jelly? What is a worm? What is a starfish? Scientifically, you'll have to define it. So pay attention to these images and these definitions that you'll see for each major grouping. The first one that we'll talk about are the sponges or periphera, which basically means flows through. Um, they are simple, sessile, meaning they don't move animals. Uh, they are filter feeders, they lack true tissues, and you probably already watched the video uh, on them as well. And so, But they do have internal canals or tunnels through their body, and their cells are grouped together. They are more than colonial, they are truly multicellular, but even we can't say they have really true tissues because of their arrangement. And so they have coanocytes and amoebocytes, um, and these help both flow water through their system, filter it out, and transport things throughout their body. The larvae move, they're modal, but the adults are sessile. They kind of uh, anchor themselves somewhere in their filter feeders. One of the cool things about having no true tissues is if you reduced a sponge all the way down to single cell, it could regenerate itself, and that would be an amazing quality called totipotency. Uh, that is something that we have lost due to complexity. And so you can see their arrangement, though we can't really talk about true tissues here in this image. And that's basically a sponge, the simple, multi most simple multicellular creature on the planet in an old form of life. We go up a level and we talk about the cnidarians, uh, like the thorn or thistle is what the, is uh, rooted in their name. And the classic one is a jellyfish. And if you've ever been stung by a jellyfish, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'll upload some videos on them later. So cnidarians include hydras, like hydra has basically the tentacles, ten tentacles facing up. Jellies have the bell shape with the tentacles facing down. And then you have anemones, you're probably thinking of Nemo on that one. And coral also are a part of the cnidarians and they all have these stinging cells. They are diploblastic, which means they have two layers of tissue, not three. They are carnivorous. Most of them move, though not all of them. They are all tentacled, but they don't have a mesoderm. They don't have any true muscles. So they're basically a swimming stomach. They do have a neural net nerve cells and uh, polyp versus medusa basically means tentacles up versus tentacles down. And so you can see in the images of their variety some options here. When you talk about cnidarian anatomy, you'll see polyp versus medusa. It's basically the same structure, but invers inverted. All cnidarians, pretty much with the exception of a couple, go through this polyp and medusa stage. Some start out as a medusa, they swim, they settle down, they form a polyp, that'd be an anemone, whereas uh, jellies start as polyps and then they release copies of themselves and become medusas. But they all have the same basic structure of a swimming stomach with these tentacles. 
Now they're called uh, cnidarians because of the cnidocytes, the stinging cells. I will upload a video where you get to see this, but it does have literally a trigger on it that is activated by contact and they penetrate through two or three layers of tissue and inject a neurotoxin since they would lose in a fight they have to neutralize their uh, the movement of their prey pretty quickly by blocking the chemicals signals that nerves use to communicate so here is your portuguese man of war and your hydras your jellyfish that you're familiar with you have a box jelly which actually is considered to be mobile not modal it can direct its movement and anemones and corals. So they have radial symmetry. But if we come up another level of complexity, we are now going to cross a threshold. So from sponges who went no tissues to jellies went to tissues, radial symmetry, and then we go up another threshold in complexity to finally uh, bilateral creatures, platyhelminthes or flatworms. You know these as planaria, they live in our creek. There's a land planaria that's about six to eight inches long that you'll probably find in your backyards with all this rain. And of course, this is a marine version here. So we have crossed this threshold into being bilateral. They are unsegmented. They use diffusion to do gas exchange and get rid of their waste. They have no circulatory system. Tapeworms are disgusting. They don't have a digestive system because they don't need one. They pretty much just um, drink your juice, if you will. They take your blood and all your nutrition. Um, but they are also cephalized, which is an official term, basically meaning having a head where all of their main sensory organs are put in the on the side in which they move. So they move in the direction of their sense organs, and that's what it means to be a cephalized, where you concentrate nerve cells, sensory organs, and usually the mouth in the same spot because animals eat to move and move to eat. The only weird exception to this are the planaria. Uh, they have this pharynx where they both take in their food, exchange sperm because they're hermaphroditic, um, as well as get rid of their waste through that or through their flame cells. But if you'll notice in this flatworm, it has a head, it's got ganglia or nerves, and it's got nerve cords that run down its body. Not a chordate, not like you, but pretty close. We're going to sneak up to you. One of the weird things from your book was this idea of a fluke. It has a kind of a double life, uh, com commonly found in freshwater rice paddies. They like that kind of environment. And they basically um, get picked up through feces, through waste material. They get into a human through, say, an open wound or through an orifice like nose or mouth. And they get into the blood and uh, round and round it goes. So some of these guys are pretty disgusting. Um, after this is the tapeworm. Your dogs can get this. And so basically they have that scolex and uh, they have these hooks. They latch onto the digestive system and they just drink the blood from the creature. Each one of those proglottids has upwards of, I think, 200 different eggs, and they can have as many as 2,000 proglottids. Last on the list are the rotifers, still an invertebrate, but even though they're microscopic, they have uh, specialized organ systems. They have an alimentary canal, which means they have an opening and exit for digesting food. These live in our creek, and they're kind of this weird group that belong with the invertebrates but have a number of characteristics like digestive organs and specialized ways of catching food and they move they swim very fast so that's it gang we are done for this particular section uh, next one up is mollusks and then we'll get to arthropods and then we'll be done with invertebrates